Okay, okay, I'm really happy to have Daniel Berger here. Um, Daniel has been through multiple institutions before he got here. Um, he's done work at ETH Zurich, at Kaiserslautern, and most recently he's been at CMU as a, as a project scientist slash postdoc. Um, and his interests are mainly in a lot of the mathematical and theoretical aspects of performance modeling as well as in systems. Um, and today he's going to tell us a little bit about work he's done on tail latency and um, industrial strength caching systems. And in particular, we also have had a collab collaboration in the past um, in this area. And one thing that's I really like about Daniel's work is that um, he really takes product impact and thinking about what matters in industry uh, to heart. So thanks, Daniel, for having me. Thank you, Seth, and hi, everyone. Super excited to be here. So my title is Tail Latency Meets Caching and Unusual Alliance. And if the unusual alliance doesn't make a lot of sense right now, I promise you in like five, six slides, you know why I call this unusual. All right, today I want to start talking about interactive applications. And interactive applications, for example, when we use our phones to communicate, or you know, when we use some devices to learn, when we game, or even in medical research, they really changed our lives, right? I mean, they've brought a huge social benefit in our everyday lives. I'm an engineer for today, a systems person, so I will ask, what does it take to build an interactive application? And obviously, there are really many aspects to be considered. There's the user interface, there are security aspects, there's the actual hardware and sensors, there's many algorithms involved, so many, many more aspects than I've even mentioned right now. I, on the other hand, work on performance. And by performance, I mean a low latency. So what do I mean by latency? So to see this, let's abstract the way, the context here, and see what happens when you press that button on a device. What really happens is that we have to go to a remote location. You can't just stay on the server and do the pro uh, on that device and do the processing here. Why, why is that? Well, we're interacting with many other users. All of that has to happen. That data has to sit in some central location. For example, if we talk about this doctor use case, maybe there's some patient records that have to be fed into the system. Maybe there's a heart rate monitor and all of that. So all of this sits behind this web service. And so when you press that button, what really happens, a request travels across the internet starts being processed in that web service, and then the answer finally comes back. And that's what we call latency. Now, when we talk about interactivity, whenever you press that button, until it returns, that has to be really fast. This really demands low latency. So much so that even you know, mainstream publications title that impatient web users, an eye, a blink of the eye latency is too long. A couple hundred milliseconds is too long. So what can we do? Where does latency come from in the system? Now, if we think about this use case here, what really happens is that there's a great geographic distance between them. For example, that doctor might be sitting somewhere in Hawaii, and the servers over here might be somewhere here in New York. That's a distance that can only be traveled at the speed of light or even lower than that. Physics demands that there is quite some latency already involved. Now, furthermore, if you look at that web servers, what really happens is there's a whole data center behind this, not just one server involved. So, for example, you might have a patient database, you might have a medical record system, a recommender system, and so on. And when a user request enters that, we will query all of these backend systems, and we will have to wait for all of these queries to return. So the patient database might return the query pretty quickly, the medical record system might take longer, and now the recommender hasn't returned yet. We have to wait until finally we get that answer and we can ship the request back to the user. So latency comes from the fact that we have to wait for these many, many servers. In practice, these are hundreds of servers that are involved. If any of them is slow, we'll have to wait for that server. So these here, I call those the backend queries. And the overall user perceivable request latency basically comes from the distance traffic traveled and the maximum of all of these query latencies. Any questions so far? Does all of that make sense so far? 
Yes? So I guess it seems like some of this you can hide behind UI. Like if images are slow, you can have a gray box. Or OK, OK. Is, does that sort of like fit in this abstraction somehow? Or I'm mostly ignoring that. That's a very good observation. I'm thinking about this. You know, you're a medical doctor, and you click on a patient name, and you basically really want to see this patient's records, right? So similar, we worked with Xbox with, with, with Sid. If in the Xbox store, you know, you click on, you know, some product in there, how long does it actually take until you see something? There's not a lot you can do. You can have a spinning wheel. But how long does it take to really request and, and, and get that back? OK, but what can you do? So that's a very good question. UI changes, that's definitely something I haven't considered, but that's a good guess. But what we computer scientists always do when there's something slow that we have to wait for, we put a cache in front of it. In CPUs, you do that. In distributed systems, we always put a cache. So what does that mean? Well, this caching system will store the most popular items from all of these backend systems. And frequently, when a request comes in, so you don't even need to go deeper into that data center. Now, there's still this distance in here, right? We are still in Hawaii. So additionally, we put another caching system here, where often a request comes in, and you don't even need to do all that way over there. So that's the idea of caching. Super successful has given us probably an order or two orders of magnitude in reducing the mean latency of, of user-perceived requests. Today, that gives us caches everywhere. So recently, I was looking at how Facebook's content delivery works, and more than 80% of all of their service, all of their energy costs, goes into caching systems. It's not so much the back ends. It's we've built so many of these caching systems in front. That's where all our resources go. Now, you might say, with all of these resources, is reducing the mean latency what these caches give us, is that enough? You probably have noticed, you know, when you're using a device, usually it's pretty fast. But then once in a while, there's a spinning wheel, and you're kind of stuck behind that. So what we really care about is kind of the 1% worst cases, like these cases where you have to wait. That's what we call the tail, the tail latency. So the way we typically measure that is the P99, the 99 percentile of latency, the worst 1%. And whenever I talk to Microsoft, but also to Facebook and Google, all of these companies tell me that they want to have the P99 below a couple hundred milliseconds, for example, 150 milliseconds. Now, that's a good goal to have, but in practice, we see that not all of these companies actually achieve this in all of these services. And you'll see that in a couple slides. Now, you can come back and ask, we've built all these caches. Do caches actually help the P99? We talked about the mean. The P99 is a little bit different. So the typical case when you think about caches is that they're really good at storing the most popular items. But then once in a while, you're requesting someone. You know my grandpa, grandma's um, social network page there's only a few people who are really interested in that, not a popular page. So what happens is you may have a cache miss here, you may have a cache miss there, and you have to go to these backend systems. So typically, caches can't hold everything. So what really happens is that the tail latency is defined by these backend systems. To make that a little bit more concrete, let me introduce the mental model that many of us in the systems performance community have. So often we say cache hits are really fast, let's say 10 milliseconds, and cache misses are really slow, let's say 200 milliseconds. Now, in practice, we observe these caches all together have a cache hit ratio that is less than 99%. Typically, what you really see is like 80, 90%, but never above 99%, which means more than 1% of all the requests will go to these backends. These are going to be cache misses. Now, even if your caches are suddenly a millisecond fast, it's still more than 1% here. And thus, caching does not seem to help tail latency. Right? So let me summarize. There's this very famous paper called The Tail at Scale, which is built, um, cited hundreds of times, made by Jeff Dean and Andrew Burroughs of famous Google architects. And they have this one citation here I'm blowing up. They say caching layers do not directly address tail latency. 
this is the belief in the community when I started my PhD. People believe caches don't help tell latency. Now, if we look and sum this all together, we establish that we need low tail latency. Caches are basically the majority of the infrastructure cost, and yet caches don't even help tail latency. So something doesn't add up here, right? Something needs to change. And so what I worked on in my dissertation work is to work on that assumption. Why don't caches help tail latency? Is that even true? But basically, the conclusion is we just have to build caches in a different way. That's the conclusion from that. That's pretty obvious. So let's revisit our mental model that we just established here. If we reconsider this example, what really happens, that assumption here that every single request to these backend systems is going to take 200 milliseconds, that's not exactly true. Backend latency among hundreds of servers among millions of requests is actually quite variable. And caches are really, really good at basically getting rid of this variability to some extent, which you will see in a couple minutes. And second, if you just you know, went ahead with that idea that caches don't help to latency at all, you might just remove all of this. You would get probably a 10 to 100x higher load on these backend systems. So suddenly, instead of processing a million requests, they have to process 100 million requests. So they would get overloaded. So caches definitely have some sense in there, right? Now, let me ask you, why haven't we been doing this then? Like, why haven't we been building caches that look at this tail latency case? And to answer this, I went into the literature, and I found that there's really two camps. There's the systems performance cam on one hand, and there's the caching cam on the other hand. And they're pretty separate from each other. The systems performance cam talks a lot about slow servers and how you could bypass them. It talks about over-provisioning just enough so that most of the servers are basically idle and ready to go. Caching people, they're all about hit ratio. That's the main metric. Every single paper that talks about caching talks about that. Hit ratio has a very clear relationship to mean latency and throughput, but the relationship to tail is not quite clear. And I know that this gap exists because I've been a member of both communities. I've published in the top venues in both of these, and I've looked at tail latency without caches, and I've looked at hit ratios without tail latency. I've been part of this myself. However, in my dissertation work, I've been trying to pull these two together. I've been trying to unify them using performance modeling, which really tells us what are the causes of tail latency, and system implementation that show that we can actually do better in real systems. And over the last three years, I've been able to pull these two communities together. And thus, we come to the title of my talk, Tail Latency Meets Caching, an Unusual Alliance. It's unusual because these two camps were very separate before, and I've been trying to unite them. Now, in the following, I'll talk about two papers called Robin Hood, um, which appeared at OSTI last year, which was a collaboration with Sid, and Adapt Size, which appeared at NSTI two years ago, which was a collaboration with Akamai. And then I'll conclude classically with some extensions and future work. Now, I'll start with Robin Hood, unless you guys have any questions right now. Any more questions? Any more concerns? Good. OK. So let's look at Robinhood. All of this was pretty abstract. In Robinhood, we'll look at a very, very specific example. So coming back to this here, we will ask what causes high tail latency in these data center systems. We will just focus on that right part, and then the second part we'll focus on the left part. Now, if you look at this, remember that a single request that comes into the system triggers these many, many queries to backend systems. So what we did, and that was a collaboration with Sid, we went ahead and measured what happens in an Xbox.com request. So what do I mean by this? Well, we measured the query P99 latency, so these individual colorful guys over there, over the course of a typical day in March last year. And what we observed is that individual systems have these spikes in latency. The purple one in the morning, the green one in the afternoon, and the red one in, in, at night. Now, remember, we have to wait for the last of these queries. We have to wait for the max. So whenever an individual one of these spikes, it's really bad for us. 
Whenever the green one spikes, we have to weigh that and the red one the same. What can we do? That's basically what we've been trying to address. Now, if you look a little bit behind the scenes of what happens during one of these spikes, what you will really realize is there's high load in this case. Now, from performance modeling, we know that these P99 latency curves versus the load, basically how much capacity, how many resources are being used, these curves always look like this. They always have that shape. Now, if we're in one of those high load situations, we're really at the right top part of that graph. On the other hand, if you look at that green system, the bottom one over here, we are at the low load case of that green backend system. Remember, these are totally different systems from each other. Now, at a high level, what we want to do is maybe we can make the load a little bit higher here, but reduce the load over here, right? And the real rationale behind this is that if you have a small reduction in the load in that purple system, you can have an outsized impact on the latency just by the shape of these curves. So a small reduction in load here gives us a huge P99 reduction. And since this is the max, since we're waiting for that purple system, this will help the overall request latency. Now, this sounds a lot like load balancing, right? That's basically the idea, whatever you use in networking, you know, if some system is overloaded, you shift some of the requests to another system. But unfortunately, we call that, you know, one of those was a patient database, the other one was a recommender system. You can't really send a patient database request to the recommender system. It's not actually the same as load balancing. That you really can't do. But what we propose is to use the cache to do that. We basically use the cache to shift load. And that's what gives rise to this Robinhood caching system idea. So what do I mean by using the cache to shift load? Well, if we go back to this caching, center, caching system here, what we really can do in practice is we can partition the total cache space by backend system. And then what we will do is the share of the cache space that goes to each of these backend systems, we will change that over the course of the day. So maybe in the morning we start with some allocation, and then we realize this purple system has a huge spike in latency, so we will allocate a large fraction of the cache space to that purple system. Now what does that mean? As you give it much more cache space, you will cache a much larger fraction of this, you will increase the hit ratio, and thus load on that system goes down. As I said, even a small reduction in load here will help us a lot. And then similarly, as the green system spikes, you will increase that, and as the red system spikes, and so on. So that's the high level idea. We dynamically partition the caching system to minimize the request P99. And Robinhood is the first system that proposes that idea and actually evaluates that. Of course, we also made sure that this is deployable on a software stack as we already use it in systems today. So we don't have to make major changes. And second, that this scales well, because in practice, you don't just have three backend systems. So at Xbox, it's somewhere in the three to 50 backend systems range, and there's a lot of these caching servers in front, in the orders of 64 servers. So we have to make sure that all of this works pretty well at scale. Okay, now I told you we are basically partitioning that cache space. It seems like a pretty easy idea. But how do we actually do this? How do we repartition the cache? At a high level, jumping to the right allocation, as I did in that picture before, is actually pretty hard. So what we instead do, we do it gradually over time. So every five seconds, we tax each of these backends 1%. So we take away 1% of the cache space. And then we basically have Robinhood come in, and Robinhood redistributes the cache. It takes from the rich backend systems and gives to the poor. OK, so how do we redistribute the cache? Well, if you remember, we had this graph before with these P99 latency spikes. A pretty reasonable idea would be to give this tax, give the cache space to the high latency backends. Does that make sense to you? Seems like a pretty good idea. Well, unfortunately, that turns out to not work well in practice. And let me explain why that is with a counterexample. So in reality, what we often observe is that there's not just 
one type of Xbox or patient records request. There's different types of requests. And these different types of requests can have different dependencies on these backend systems. For example, there could be the type 1 request, which makes up 99.5% and uses the purple and the red system. And maybe there's another half of the request that only goes to the green backend system. Now, if that green backend system happens to have high latency, according to the algorithm we just defined, what we will do, well, we increase the share of the green guy in that cache. Well, accordingly, that will hopefully reduce the load but it will also increase the load on all the others. But remember, our goal is the P99 request latency. These type two guys only make up half a percent of all the requests. Whatever we do there is very unlikely to affect the actual P99. There are just too few of these people to really um, you know, affect the P99. So this is a pretty easy example. In reality, you have hundreds or at least tens of backend systems each request triggers hundreds of queries to them, and then you have thousands of different request types. While this is pretty easy, in reality, figuring out the exact relation between all of these is very, very hard. We've not been able to come up with a simple heuristic where you just measure one thing and you're basically done with it. So initially, as performance modeling people, we came up with a bunch of theory. That bunch of theory basically generalizes this idea of an optimal allocation. You can do all of that, but it is very hard to implement that in practice. You can invalidate using this theory. You can invalidate many of these ideas here, but you can't really implement that because you need many measurements, has many mathematical assumptions. So instead what we do in Robinhood is we use that theory to come up with a heuristic. And that heuristic is based on the idea to find the actual cause of the high request P99. What does that mean? Well, if you measure request latencies and order them from the fastest request, the P0, to the slowest request, the highest latency, the P100, the P99's got to be somewhere in there, right? Now, conceptually, you can look at this P99 request and find the cause. Among the many queries that this request triggered, there must have been one backend that was the slowest. We call that the blocking backend, and we could allocate cache resources toward that. That's basically a pretty causal relationship. Now, unfortunately, basically out of these many, many thousand samples, we're looking only at one sample, so that's pretty inefficient. In addition, you can't just have, it's often that it's not just one latency spikes, there's many latency spikes at the same time. So you have to be able to deal with this. So what we do instead is we look at a neighborhood around the P99 to figure out which requests are most likely to affect the P99. So for all of these, we again ask the question, who blocked these requests? And that way, we compute what we call the request blocking count, the RBC, where for each backend, we figure out how often did you block, how often were you the slowest query in one of those P99 neighbor requests. And then we allocate in proportion to that distribution. So we take away 1% of the tax and reallocate in proportion to that distribution every five seconds. Does that idea make sense so far? Yes? So I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So <clears throat> if, if there's one server who's getting hit always with totally unique queries, yep. then this yep. is not going to help. Is that right? If there's one, okay, so you're talking about unique in the sense that they're uncacheable. Yeah, basically. Okay, if there's one service that is 100% uncacheable, it's really, really hard to use the cache at all. I mean, you have a 0% cache hit ratio. Would you so, end up allocating all the cache to it anyway? Okay, in our system, we were lucky that um, the Xbox people, they know which systems are cacheable and not. So we basically ignored that problem altogether. But what we found is that out of the 30 systems we had, 25 were cacheable. So it's pretty cacheable, even though, like if you think about a recommender system, which seems like it's personalizing things a lot. What really happens is you have these many products, and basically passed on your, based on your past purchases of these products, you're trying to make a prediction which product you might be interested in. 
what we can use, and what people use in practice, is that vector of past purchases, use that to index the cache. So even things that look very hard to cache, you can actually cache in practice. OK, I think you were first. Yeah, Three just questions. Just to elaborate a little bit on Kyle's point. So I, I, the way I see the question is not really things that are uncacheable versus things that are cacheable. OK. But the things may actually differ in their cacheability. Mm -hmm. So like, in other words, imagine that you have yep. sort of like a derivative for each one of these things. Yes. That if I give it a little bit more cash, how much effect does that actually have? Right. And you sort of ideally want to incorporate that responsiveness yes. and not just like the blockingness. That is a very, very good point. We played with that a lot. So first what I can tell you is that in production that really happens in, okay. in, in the data set we have. We have ca you know, some backends go to like 95% hit ratios. Others go to 40% hit ratios. So we have the whole range and the curves are really, really different. Yeah. What we end up finding in our experiments is that even if someone is not very cacheable, if that's the one that is causing the P99, if this is the one that dominates the RBC, you still want to give resources to it. No, I agree. Because you wait for it. If you're really, I mean, you can't do anything else. But, but it seems like there should be like a product of those two things ha! that is what you sort on. We tried to do exactly that. That was one of the other heuristics we had. Yeah. It turns to be worse than just this metric. Uh -huh. Because it is, you know, some people are so uncashable, but they still dominate the, res the, the workload at some point. But, but Glenn's yeah. intuition is, I think, spot on, right? This is, Absolutely. This is what they call a curve, a hit ratio curve. Yes. How much, if I give you a little more space, how well can you use it? Right. Yep. Really, that's exactly yeah. the right question. There's this, there's this thing called classical production theory in economics where basically like you allocate things using these elasticities, but also yes. these shares. And so there's, there's some right. like optimal way to sort of like weight to, to navigate right. those curves. two things. So, so it's not literally the product. It's like some exponent of one and some exponent uh, of the okay. other and okay. so forth. Okay. So. That is really cool. I, so we've tried and experimented with this, and we tried yes, to we solve that in it theory. Online, but yeah. It turns out to be pretty hard to consider that. But that's a good point. I think there was another question. It was the same one. It was the same one. OK, thank you. That was a really good point. Cool. So now we have an algorithm. As I said before, I'm interested in actually implementing all of that. So when you go back to the actual system, you will find that this looks a little bit different from what we've considered so far. So there's a couple challenges. The first is that there's not just one caching server. There's many caching servers that you have to manage together. So we have to do that algorithm that we just defined in a distributed fashion, right? Second, you want very fast reaction times. And what happens is that basically in front of these caching servers, there's a load balancer. Let's say it sends basically requests round robin to all of them. An individual server might not get a very high request late rate. And what, when something changes in the workload, the amount of data that an individual server has often is not to, enough to actually react quickly enough. So the problem is getting a sufficient number of measurements. Because we look at the tail, we basically throw away almost everything. So we basically have to have, make that our main focus. So the first thing we came up with, the first distributed version, decoupled all of these servers where we relied on local measurements and made local decisions on all of them. That didn't work well with that second requirement because individual servers don't get a lot of data. So in the end, we ended up with a design that pools measurement with all of these servers, but that introduces new problems because you still want to be scalable in the number of caching servers, and you want to be fault tolerant in the sense that if that way to pool these measurements fails, you basically still want to be able to continue. I'm, that's a typical systems challenge. I'm not sure all of you are interested in, so I'll, I'm very, very happy to talk about that offline. But basically, we came up with a design that was mostly stateless, and if any failures occur, you could just restart the whole service. So that was the key idea here. OK, so that's the overall implementation. Now, how did we experiment this? Uh, how did we evaluate this? Well, we basically went and talked a lot to the production teams. Um, SID was basically enabling us to directly figure out what their architecture of these backend systems is. And then we replicated the whole setup on Azure. So what does that mean? Well, we put a request generator in front of it, replay one of the production traces we have for a couple hours at a time at a several rate of queries as you see that in production. And then we built a couple of caching servers and 20 different backend systems, where each backend system runs up to 10 servers each. 
So overall, you're looking at about 100 servers in that experiment. Now, the final piece, basically, in building this experimental setup is that we have to emulate these query latency spikes that we see in production. And we do this on each of these backends by limiting the amount of resources that they have available, which gives us latency spikes of a similar magnitude and a similar frequency as basically we see those in production. Now, that's our overall setup. Now, you're finally ready to see some evaluation results. Do you also try to yes. play, like, the, like the, do you try to uh, deal with something like correlation between these requests? Okay, what really happens is we know a request comes in, and it sends queries, you know, 100 queries to this guy, 20 queries to that guy, and all of that. That's part of the workload which we recorded. So, so, so on the front end, you were going to uh, replay that. Effort. Exactly. We had all of that together. OK? Good. Now, in, in our evaluation, we basically start with the original system that people use at Microsoft, which is called the one rendering framework. And we measure the request P99 latency in that over several hours in our experiment. So added this dashed line at 150 milliseconds because that's our latency goal. And as you can see here, whenever one of those latency spikes occurs in the back ends, we also have a latency spike in the request P99. And you frequently violate that latency goal. So overall, this meets the latency goal only about 70% of the time on that day. Now, we also compared this to several caching systems, state-of-the-art caching systems you have in the literature. As I mentioned earlier, most of these caching systems focus on the hit ratio. And the hit ratio doesn't have a strict relationship to the tail. What ends up happening if you focus on the hit ratio is you make that system much, much worse. Whenever you don't see that red line here, that system's latency is about 500 milliseconds. So focusing on hit ratio without considering latency, that clearly doesn't work. Now finally, we also compared to this kind of straw man example I mentioned earlier, where you just try to balance the, uh, the tail latencies between all these backends. You just allocate in proportion to the tail latency you observe. So that was the most realistic idea we found in the literature. But unfortunately, again, because it doesn't really figure out what is the cost of the, uh, of the P99 request latency, it comes up with very, very high latency. And now, finally, Robinhood, our own system in comparison, is the only caching system that really, really actively keeps that latency below the 150 millisecond goal. On this pretty challenging day trace, we find that it meets the latency goal about 99% of the time versus the second system meets it only 70% of the time. So we have a pretty large reduction in these latency goal violations. Now, you might ask, why does this actually work so well? We only changed the cache, right? That's a pretty, pretty small change we did. Well, behind all of this stands the fact that Robinhood makes a trade-off. It's not just you know, doing some magic behind the scenes. It sacrifices the performance of some backends that do not currently matter for the P99 request latency. And we find it actually increases these latencies by up to two and a half times. So you will get higher latencies on some backends. But in return for this, it reduces the latency of the bottleneck backends, and we see there on average a four times improvement on the bottleneck backends. So overall, if you look at the number of times that latency goal is violated, we get about a 30x reduction in all of these. That's the overall, overall idea of Robinhood. I'm sure there's many more systems questions, but you have more questions about the design and the evaluation. It's yes? Like if you just kind of plot the histogram of uh, the latencies one versus the other, like, and you just kind of look at it, like, like where, well, what is that part where you see the difference? Is it kind of like consistently? Is it consistently better? Right up. Oh, no, no. I'm, so on one end, so you're reporting at, at, at a single point, and you give us a flavor about like up to 2.5x. I'm just kind of more curious. Like, oh, how much does it make it worse? I'm literally just plotted the, the CDF of one versus the other, like like the like the, or histogram of one. You know. The, I'm not quite sure. I understand what you mean, but this two and a half times higher is basically an average. You're saying like say, so how so the, the average goes up by. Uh, it could go like some cases. The, the backends that don't matter for the P99, we see them go up in, by 10 times in like the worst case. So that happens. But it doesn't matter for the, the request. This okay, is the individual so what, what, what one. What I'm asking is if you, uh, if you measure the, like the percentile yeah. of, the, of the request satisfaction, 
at, at other points than 99? I guess like what's happening with P75, P50? Yes, P50, okay, like, like sure. Kind of we have all of that. That's, that's in the paper. What, what happens is we very narrowly focus on the P99. So we make these other verse. Specifically, the P50, we, off, we saw, I think, a 40% increase in the P50. So all of that happens. OK, another question. So the, the metric you're using is a proxy for the system load, for the each backend load. Yes. What happens if you try to actually use the actual load? The actual the load? Well, the problem is, again, the load is similar to basically measuring the P99 directly. You need to relate all of this to the request level, like the higher level component and the tail latency of that. If you basically allocate in proportion to the load, just to the high load backends, you basically end up with a system that is very similar to this, which balances the career latencies. We also tried balancing the load. It's basically the same as this idea. You have to always relate this to the actual cost of the request P99. Does that make sense? So it's not much the load, but it's the how the load relates to the latency. Yes, it's the load, how it relates to the overall request goal. OK, yes. I'm going to like push a little further on Miro's question over here. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like you're kind of singularly optimizing for this 90 yes. percentile latency. And I feel like a lot of systems people, when they originally came up with this measure, it was more a shorthand to say you should care about outliers. Uh -huh. And you sort of made it the singular goal for the system. Right. And implicit in this is that you're, you're assuming that the quality of experience is kind of flat up till anywhere up to P99, and then there's a drop off. But really, there's kind of this okay. gradual decay. And that's the metric I think you really care okay. about. So how does I'm not quite sure that which metric you're proposing, but let me first answer why we narrowly care about the P99. So what the P90 really, P99 really is, is we're talking about 99% of the people, right? And basically, we make the verse 99, you know, that threshold, we make that good enough so that it is an interactive application. 150 milliseconds basically works, and you will be able to use that service. For all these people below you, it's going to be better than that. Right? So for 99% of the people, it will actually work. Now, why don't we look at the 99.9 .9 or the 99.99 .99 and all of that? So you can do this. You can just, it's a, it's a parameter in our system, or if you have some, you know, you prefer one over the other, you could have some combined metric. But the reason most systems really focus on the, uh, not an extreme percentile, like a lower percentile, is just that it gets very costly to optimize, it's a Pareto principle, right? Once you basically get 80%, or in this case, 99%, getting that last 1%, you will need a lot more resources. So there's a lot of crazy events that happen. If you look at the 3049's case, you have to deal more with failures. You have to deal with like you know network connectivity problems. This is just basically where, this is the state of the art where we can do something right now. If you ask me in 10 years, I hope we're talking about 349's. But I guess my question is for the other half of the thing, which is saying the that, lower. Yes, that uh, if if I was getting a forty millisecond latency and now I you know push it up to one hundred and forty nine milliseconds, yep. I'm still within the ninety ninth percentile. You are, but my quality of experience has gone perceptibly been reduced as a consequence of. That. I I would argue if you're going from forty milliseconds to one hundred forty milliseconds, you won't notice it. So in most of these, the goal is. Overall, I think what the, what the measurement studies show, what people notice is 300 milliseconds is the actual threshold. So 150 milliseconds has a, actually some margin to what people can notice in these cases. I would agree if you did, you know, did new user experiments and you basically show me that suddenly people care about 50 milliseconds, we need to you know, re-engineer all of that. But that's what we know. So I guess far. maybe the question more broadly, though, is that do you feel like focusing on this as opposed to the entire distribution is a particularly valuable metric to use at all? Like? I would argue so. Okay. My, the ideal distribution that I would have is that everyone gets exactly the same latency, and maybe you have you know, 99%, they all get 150 milliseconds. I would make that trade-off any time, and I think most production teams would love to do that, too. OK, cool. Good. So that was one project. I actually have a second talk. Uh, let me move forward. Uh, I have a second part, so let me actually walk you through that second example, too. So, so far, we've mostly talked about the data center, right? But there's this whole other talk over, part over here, the edge caching systems that we haven't talked about. So there, in edge caching, if you really look at one of these server systems, they really consist each of an in-memory cache and a disk cache. They have a huge amount of capacity. Now, 
We've worked with one of the largest edge caching systems out there, which is Akamai. They deliver about 30% of all internet content, including a lot of Microsoft content. So we talked to them, and we did a couple of observations of what the workload of the server system looks like. And what we observed is the cumulative distribution function over the different sizes of objects that this server delivers and the in-memory cache encounters. And what we find here is that you have a couple of one-byte objects and going all the way up to tens of gigabytes. That's nine orders of magnitude of variability. And all these cases actually occur. Now, why, why am I pointing this out? Well, whenever one of those large objects enters this in-memory cache, that in-memory cache is not that much larger than the largest objects. Whenever these large objects enter the cache, you push out many, many, many of these smaller objects. A 10 gigabyte object versus a couple million one kilobyte objects. You're losing many of those small guys. And very soon after, you may get a request for these small people again, which now has to be a cache miss. And these bursts of memory cache misses then have to be served by the disk cache. And we observe at Akamai, at Wikipedia, we've done that again, at Facebook, we've done that again. That's a frequent cause of overloading the disks. And these disks now are actually the factor of introducing high latency. So we built that whole caching system to reduce latency, but now the caching system itself is a factor of introducing high latency. So what's the real problem here? The real problem here is this amount of variability. The in-memory cache is just too small, so to say, for this amount of variability. So what could you do? Well, a pretty obvious idea is maybe those large people over here, maybe they should just not enter the cache in the first place, right? They were the reason we have these drops in hit ratio and these bursts of misses to the disk cache. So you might say, we just can't admit every object. Now, if we look at the literature, if we look at caching systems, and we surveyed caching systems from 1993 all the way up to 2016, 31 out of 33 caching systems out there admit objects of all sizes. They just ignore this huge amount of variability. And the two remaining systems that basically do consider size, A, they're from the 90s. Second, they have never been implemented. They're very, very theoretical systems. So what we did in adapt size is basically ask this question, which objects should you admit in this first level in-memory cache that we use in any kind of content delivery network? Now, if you have the choice between a small object and a large object, let's make this a kilobyte and a gigabyte, it's a pretty clear choice, right? You would prefer that small object. So you might just introduce a threshold policy and say, I always prefer the objects below that threshold. But in reality, this is a little bit more complicated because objects also differ in their arrival rates, in their popularity. So there might be an unpopular object, and clearly an unpopular large object, I don't want to admit. A very popular small object, it's pretty obvious. But in this case, very popular and still large, at some point, you're going to want to admit those two. Now, you really need to consider this case, but in order to track popularity, in order to count how often each, request, each object is being requested, you need a lot of overhead. These systems serve a couple of billion re different requests in any given hour. The data structure to basically keep track of all of these is just unfeasible. That's why basically no one has done that before. However, there's actually a pretty easy solution to this. We propose, why don't we use probabilistic admission? What do I mean by this? Well, we define a curve that defines the admission probability for different object sizes. If you're small, you will have a high admission probability. So basically, you get into the cache on your first try. But if you're really large, you get a very low admission probability, which means if you're unpopular, it's very unlikely you'll actually get into the cache. But if you're very popular, you've been requested and again and again, eventually you will make it into the cache without us tracking any overhead at all. So that's the basic idea behind this. No overhead at all, and we can still make that distinction up there effectively. Now, unfortunately what happens, that curve that I've been showing here, 
which curve would you really use there? So I'm showing here a curve from the exponential family, which has a parameter called c. And here's another curve from that family. Which of these curves should you really choose? Now, this is really why adapt size is about adapting, because we need to tune this parameter c. Okay? So how would we do this? Well, conceptually, you could plot the hit ratio over this c parameter. And you can figure out it's a really peaky distribution where there's clearly one optimal parameter. Now, how would you find that best parameter? Well, what you could do is, you know, you could look at historical data, tune this once, figure out the optimal parameter, and then basically stick with this. We call this the static policy. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't quite work because the curve we see up there changes a lot over time. It changes even within a day. So here we are showing you the distribution at 2 p.m. And later that day, the distribution has totally changed because suddenly people are interested in video traffic, versus previously they might be interested in news. So here the optimal parameter was probably like 10 kilobyte, kilobyte and here it's 2 to 4 megabytes. It's an order or several orders of magnitude in difference between these two parameter choices. So again, how do we, oh, let me actually show you how this actually turns out. So we evaluated this on a multi-week Akamai trace, so we implemented that policy, and we find that the hit ratio varies a lot. So here I'm showing you a box plot, so that's the 25 to the 75 percentile, and the 10 to the 90 percentile in that case. And you can see this really spans the whole range between 0.2 and 0.8 hit ratio, which is the reason this amount of variability for overloading the disk cache. Now, what else could you be doing? Well, systems people have one favorite policy that we always use whenever we have to adapt a parameter. That's basically, we call it hill climbing, you know, maybe you call it gradient descent. We always just start with some optimal parameter and then over time basically walk up that, that mountain. That hasn't been proposed for that system before, but all the caching systems out there, if you look at the last decade or two, use an, a variant of that idea. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't work in this case either. As you can see in these, they have several local optima, and even with various randomized versions of hill climbing, we were often getting stuck in that case. So here I'm showing you basically the evaluation of this hill climbing algorithm, and you can see that the 25 to 75 percentiles are basically a lot more denser together, so we reduce variability a lot. But if you look at the 10 percentile, which is really the tail in this case, this still is highly variable and thus introduces a lot of variability and latency. So what we did in adapt size is to come up with a different approach to do this. We built a Markov model, a Markov chain model, that predicts the whole curve. And with that model, we can get a robust and very fast optimization because we can do that globally. We have that given curve at any point in time and just jump to the right parameter. And as an effect of that in adapt size, we get a huge reduction in this variability and thus reduce the tail latency in that system. Now, I mentioned that there's a Markov chain involved. Again, there's a lot of modeling, basically, so you can actually prove that this is the right thing and that gives us a theoretical optimality guarantee that this is actually giving the right parameter. However, you might be asking, what about the empirical effect? So we additionally evaluated what is the optimal parameter choice by looking into the future. So this is not a realistic algorithm. So we know the traffic that is ahead of us, evaluate all possible choices, and then choose the optimal parameter. And you can see, while we are somewhat close to it, there's still a gap that remains in all of these algorithms. And I will come back to that gap in a couple of slides. But overall, we are somewhat near to optimal. And so we went ahead, implemented that system, and actually deployed it in a couple systems. The problem in this is that all of these systems, they're exposed very far out close to the user. They have to serve traffic at 40 to 100 gigabits per second. You need a very high level of concurrency to deal with that amount of traffic. So the key challenge was to not interfere with this which means we had to come up with a log-free implementation and show that all of that actually works in a production system. Again, I won't go into much more detail here, but feel free to ask me offline what is behind that. And so as 
the end effect, the throughput of the system, when you compare the orange line as a production system, green as adapt size, at different levels of concurrency, there's no noticeable difference in throughput. But we get a huge improvement in P99. Here we're showing adapt size in blue compared to the second best system, hill climb. And around this time in the trace happens to be a change in the workload where a different parameter needs to be done. And you can see how both of these shoot up initially, but adapt size corrects within less than a minute. And hill climb takes a while to go down and then gets stuck in some suboptimal parameter range. So again, we get a pretty large reduction in P99 request latency. We're not just comparing to hill climb, but to the original system that didn't do any admission control at all. Now, this idea that we introduced, the problem that you have to keep, of object si keep track of object size, popularity, and be highly concurrent, has influenced a couple of papers that have come out last year, and several other follow-up papers are still on the way out. And I also want to mention that this focus on admission policies and making them adaptive has had a pretty big impact on industry. So Wikipedia has been using adapt size in production since about a year, Facebook has built a production prototype since a couple months ago, and Google actually, following up on this, they established a weekly meeting where they discuss admission policies since the last year. Unfortunately, I don't know what's happening at Microsoft in that space. But, okay, so that concludes adapt size. Do we have any more questions on adapt size? Cool. Then, the last couple minutes, I want to focus on extensions and moving forward. So, I want to start by claiming that it's an exciting time to do systems performance research. I say this because, you know, a couple of years ago, I visited Microsoft and Facebook and Google, and all of that were mostly playing, you know, lip service to this idea of efficiency, of performance properties, and all of that. But when I went back a couple of weeks ago, they were all talking about improving efficiency, reducing the number of servers that they use in a given system, and deploying even new storage technologies such as non-volatile memory to improve the overall energy efficiency. So over the last three, four years, there has been a huge shift in companies. And for example, at, at Facebook, I visited them, they were talking about a $50 million, million, um, $50 million reduction in energy cost per engineer, per month, that they were working on that project and basically implementing this. So they got a huge reduction in effect. Now, my background has basically been in this one aspect of systems performance and caching, and I think there remains quite a bit more to do. The specific thing that I'm very interested in is focusing a lot more on optimality. I showed you, I mentioned earlier that there remains a gap and the same is also in Robinhood. There's still a lot more space for improvement. And so I've been working and starting work on learning optimal caching decisions. So this is very preliminary, so I can just give you a high-level idea of what I've been working on in that space. So this idea of learning what to cache, basically from scratch, has been very, very popular with people um, at Google. For example, Jeff Dean has a paper on that. Sid um, basically evaluated that in a Hotnets paper, and many, many academics have also worked on that. The high-level idea is that we basically, oh, we have this very common approach of, you know, we have this caching system, you have many, many objects in that cache. Which of these objects should you throw out of the cache? You're basically playing kind of like a bandit problem, or many, many people have looked at reinforcement learning in that space. Now, if you look at some empirical results in that, that's actually taken from Sid's paper, if you look at a random eviction policy, which obviously doesn't do a lot, most of the learned policies that we've come up with actually don't improve a lot over random. And comparing that to the heuristics we use in production today, which really, there's no machine learning basis behind them, someone just defined least recently used eviction is a pretty good idea. Most heuristics are still much, much better than these learned policies. And so people have concluded that caching is just not amenable to training good policies. This is a really hard problem from the perspective of reinforcement learning. So I think that's a really cool area to work in. And I've started to do a couple of steps, but I have a probably slightly different perspective than what you have done. So the first question that I asked is there even room to optimize? You know, we've seen this heuristic here. 
but what if there's not much more that we can do? Like, why would we even want a learning system? And so what we showed last year is that the optimal caching policy, which is actually pretty hard to compute in these cases, is much, much further away. And there's about, in many systems, a 40 to 60% gap that we can still bridge between the best heuristics out there and opt. And the second question that I asked was simply, is caching even learnable in some sense? Now, compared to the previous work, we had the advantage that we have this optimal policy. And that optimal policy turns out to be constructive. So what we were able to do is just do imitation learning based on that, which obviously is a much, much easier in that context. And we came up with a prototype that actually outperforms all of the heuristics that we found in the literature so far. So it's only a very small improvement so far. We are not able to bridge that gap yet. But I would, I would argue that we have some preliminary results which show that we should probably work on that a little bit more maybe even you know, combine imitation learning with reinforcement learning, or I'm not a machine learning person, you know, really harvest all the ideas we have in the community or at MSR here. And there are many, many open questions that remain. For example, I've always argued about latency, not just hit ratio, but this is still about hit ratio. I would like to basically use these more systemsy performance goals, such as reducing the number of I.O. operation, or even directly reducing the number of watts, the amount of energy that we're using. And there's many, many non-traditional caching decisions where we can use all of that much more you know, non-invasively. For example, at Facebook, I've been working on bypassing their flashes because every write to a flash costs a lot of money, basically, because you can only write that many gigabytes to it. So that's a very ripe area of you know, innovation in, there, in that space because we just don't know how to do this. And looking further out, obviously many of these systems are exposed to the public internet. We have to make sure that they're robust and that we basically can deal with adversarial scenarios and basically are sure that these systems don't you know, suddenly fall over. Since I'm somewhat uh, running out of time and I don't want to keep you too much longer here, I just quickly want to mention that um, there's a couple other directions that I think are very interested, interesting in exploring this space. For example, this whole idea of how does content delivery work today, I think it's changing a lot. So I've been talking to Akamai recently, and they're really considering to completely re-architect the whole system based on some of the recent performance gains, based on some non-volatile memory changes, like some new storage technology that they've encountered. And all of that will probably change the way we use content delivery today a lot. So feel free to ask me about that. And with that, I'm very, very open to your questions and happy to start our conversation. Thank you. <laughs>